we they have discovered this these people i talked about this yesterday the people that run social media and the phones and the news systems have discovered how to trigger our um stress system hugely now when we're looking at addiction and anxiety we're definitely looking at the triggered stress system we're looking at the inability to regulate this was yesterday's lecture so what we have to pay attention to is how much we abandon ourselves and what the television companies like you know uh the news stations the the um social media and the um phones have discovered is that we have we have within our brains a flaw as F, as in f l a w now this is a global flaw this is not a flaw that's entirely only for people who are addicts so if i'm running a course on addiction one of the things that i'll talk about is this really interesting thing called the negativity bias negativity bias negativity bias is a really fascinating thing i don't know if you can read my writing i think it's quite english so if you're not english that says negativity bias let's imagine imagine that you might have been born i'm just checking the time imagine that you might have been born in a really happy lovely family everything all your needs were constantly met your mummy breastfed you and she held you in your arms and she looked at you while you breast she breastfed and whatever gender your other parent was they were there there was no arguing they didn't send you to boarding school they met your needs nobody bullied you the world was perfect not a lot of people like that but occasionally we might meet somebody who considers themselves or even behaves as if they're normal remember from the first day we most of us feel like we're thrown into hell we're in the hinterland so that was the first day's lecture if you come from this kind of background that is just pucker perfect lovely no tall dark history at all your negativity bias is 9 to 1 that's mad that means that you're nine times more likely to look for the negative than the positive and that's from a charmed life so your charmed life will give you a negativity bias of 9 to 1 now if you have a tall dark history if you have uh if let's imagine you were bullied let's imagine you were sent to boarding school blah 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 all those things that could possibly happen and you might have loved boarding school some people do if you did go to boarding school i'm going to give you two books and hopefully carry or somebody in the background will give you the um links to them one is by nick duffel it's mainly about men who go to boarding school and it's called the making of them the making of them by nick duffel and the other is by a woman called Sh- Shaverin uh I can't remember her last name Joy Shaverin and it's called boarding school syndrome so if you did go to boarding school there are books that are really really seriously worth reading they're absolutely even if you loved boarding school they give you a perspective because one of the things that we can do with our tall dark history is that we can essentially focus all the stuff on our parents and not really look at actually what happened around all of that so that's a good one but let's imagine that you have a tall dark history let's imagine there's a tall dark history there then that's going to mean that your negativity bias is going to be 200 to 1 so 200 to 1 means you're 200 times more likely to look for the negative than the positive because of what i was talking about yesterday i don't want to revisit yesterday's lecture but a brief recap is that your neural pathways your your neural elasticity is compromised if you're not working using things like breath and posture do you remember yesterday was why yoga helps so your tall dark history will give you a negativity bias of um 200 to 1 which means you're 200 times more likely to look for the negative than the positive so if your new year's resolution each year is to be more positive and for a long time until i understood this mine was it's almost impossible because your brain is wired until you do the work on your shame and on your traumatic history until you do something it doesn't have to be that you come and see a trauma therapist there's lots of ways but i'm a fan of trauma therapy you've got this very strong negativity bias now since mobile phones since uh, smartphones came along a tall dark history with a smartphone and with uh social media 
and all of those things, social media and um, now a pandemic. And if you notice the chaos that they are constantly keeping us in, it's very interesting. Your negativity bias is now 500 to one. So that means addiction during this time has gone totally off the planet. Our brains are wired by social media, by the chaos on the news, by, I don't know if you know this, but flashing red lights on the news, these flashing dots that appear on up, you know, the most recent piece of news. These tell you that your throat has been cut <laughs> and they pulsate at the speed with which blood will leave your body if your throat is slashed open. So they're designed to trigger you to your negativity bias to keep coming back to check. It's absolutely brilliant. What they've managed to do here is they've ramped up our anxiety to the level where it's almost unbearable. And the problem is because so many people have no kind of emotional regulation, the inability to manage their emotional body, that's why we're here because of addiction, self-harm, eating disorders and um, anxiety, that's why we're here then this, the only way you can cope with this much negativity bias is to act out even more. So there's more anxiety, there's more depression, there's more addiction, there's more self-harm. So it's, it's a very clever thing because now all of a sudden you're a sheep. Now free will has disappeared. It's quite fascinating. This, this turns you into literally an automaton being controlled by how much you abandon yourself how much you're not taking care of yourself plays out in this negativity bias, triggers the addiction. It's the most perfect storm. I find it fascinating. Now, I, I'm a great fan of a book called Digital Minimalism, and I can't remember the name of the author, but it's, the, it's got the picture of the USB cable. It's white USB cable on the cover. That's a very good book. And there is also a documentary on Netflix called um, something I can't remember. And, and I know that Carrie will know which one it is. So, so when we're looking at um, how we're behaving and maybe what brought us here, we're looking at this very powerful thing in our, this is, you know, up to here is pre-smartphones and pre the level of social media that we now have. But now we're, we're really out of control. And so actually moving forward, we've got to, not we've got to, we want to pay attention to self-care. We want to pay attention to how do we look after ourselves? How do we pay attention? How do we turn down the negativity bias? So I'm not a diagnosing physician and I'm not a psychiatrist, but I can tell you that if you know that your negativity bias is somewhere here, then what you do want to do is take large amounts of B12, so like two B12 a day, sublingual B12. And ideally, you want to take omega-3 every day. Omega-3 specifically. I mentioned the other day about the hippocampus. The, the omega-3 helps with the amygdala and the disconnect with the hippocampus. So B12 and omega-3 are really useful. You want to have ideally low sugar and low or managed caffeine and then we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at a couple of things that are quite interestingly useful now i don't know if simon has fallen asleep or if he's willing to just take a couple of questions relative only hi simon darling relative only to what i have talked about so i don't want to go into random questions only relative to these this right now um, could you say a little bit more about the reason why we keep going back to check social media in relation to the danger signal by flashing red lights, symbolic of bleeding? It makes me feel worse to keep checking the news, but can't stop. Yeah, this is this is the amygdala. The, do you remember yesterday? Maybe you weren't there, but yesterday I talked about this tiny little bit in the brain called the amygdala, two little glands either side of the brainstem, just underneath the neocortex. And the amygdala regulates safety. Every every behavior that is basically being talked about over these days, certainly by Chula and I, they're safety states. So addiction, drugs, alcohol, smoking, caffeine, sugar, um, shopping, self-harming behaviors, risk behaviors, gambling behaviors, 
um, eating disorders, all of these things are safety states. It's a weird thing to say, isn't it? Because you think of an addiction as an addiction, but an addiction is a safety state, as is anxiety, a safety state, as is depression, a safety state. All these, when we're triggered into our sympathetic system, I did mention the sympathetic system over the last two days, sympathetic system. Sympathetic, sounds lovely. You know you're in your stress system when you're in your sympathetic system because it's a bitch. Sympathetic system is the stress system, it's a bitch. The stress system, negativity bias is part of the stress system and the amygdala are part of the stress system. From an, I lecture about this stuff all the time. So let me go back to the last lecture I did because it's got it written out here. So I don't have to do it all again, but there's your brain, yes? So let me just get rid of all of this for a moment. Here's your brain and here's your eyes, yes? And those are, do you remember yesterday I talked about the superhighways, all the traumas flick superhighways through your brain. And then here, oh my God, there's the amygdala ready drawn underneath your brain stem. Yesterday, we're talking about adverse childhood experiences, ACE, adverse childhood experiences. We're talking about the sympathetic system. It's a bitch. Yesterday I was talking about how it's the vagus nerve, the fascia, the hormones and the major muscle groups. And yesterday I was talking about how it's fight, flight, freeze, fold, faint, food, fawn and fuck. The amygdala and the, the amygdala's job is to say, oh my God, what was that? I just triggered you, notice. And then you're going to go, oh, my God, I need to check. Oh, my God, they said there's going to be another. Have they announced the other? Did they? Did they? Are we go, oh, my God, how many numbers? What are those? Oh, my God, they're always red. Look how big, you know, that's what the, this is how it triggers your amygdala. How many likes? Did anyone like my picture? How many like? Did somebody send me a message? Oh, all of this triggers this. It triggers the safety state. That's its job. And so our job is to keep going back. And it's very, very clever what they have, what we have allowed to be done to us is quite fascinating because now we're no longer the purchasers, we're now the product. And the product is data. So our constant checking, I don't know if you know this, but if you have uh, Facebook and Facebook Messenger on your phone or on your iPad, you legally give it permission to listen to everything that you say. I'm not legally as a therapist allowed to use Skype or Messenger uh, for any kind of work calls or Skype, you know, the Facebook um, filming thing, because everything is copied, everything is downloaded and it's all transcribed. Everything, you're, you're constantly giving away your data. So therefore they know that I, they know, Facebook know that I don't like pictures of animals being hurt. So they only have, I don't look at the Facebook news, no news feed anymore because it's only pictures of people cutting the heads off giraffes and things like that. I get really triggered. And then I'm absolutely horrible. So negativity bias means that we have to keep going back and checking. So that was a good question, Simon, keep going. Oh my God, so many of messages. Questions, a couple of questions about B12. Um, could you say a bit more about the connection to B12? My sister is on injections for B12 deficit. She lives in fear of Armageddon chicken or egg well yeah i mean I'm, I'm i don't want to comment on somebody's sister i'd much rather talk personally so i can't comment on your sister but b12 is very good for your stress system b12 it's a bit like if you're if you're an ex-drug addict an alcoholic and you're in early recovery you want to be doing the b12 the omega-3 and vitamin c and b complex because you want to get your brain reset you've got this brain that's you, you know if you think about Let's imagine that we all meet here and let's imagine instead of saying we're addicts or we're anxious, you know, we're anxious people or we're self-harmers. Let's imagine we say that we don't have a disease. I don't believe in the disease model, but we have a really specific and deeply entrenched need to activate self-care. Let's imagine that somewhere inside us, there's a little room with a small hurt child locked away in it. And this small hurt child desperately wants to be loved, desperately wants to be taken care of, and we just keep not doing it. This is why we're here, because we're drug addicts, alcoholics, self-harmers or whatever. We're not taking care of the self. The purpose of my lecture today is to help you activate self-care. And one of the things that you want to be able to do is take care of the neural pathways in your brain where those ball bearings have been flicked, which are the adverse childhood experiences. 
and the, these supplements really help. Um, there's not many about what the to on topic because they were from earlier, but I've never even thought I had a, any anxiety, but now I think it's been my normal. My anxiety has been hidden in different ailments to stop those started addictions to opioids is this, is this common yeah most people don't it's a funny thing i'm not going to go on the big screen because it messes up the recording to see everybody but um i think that um if i had a big screen and i said how many people discovered that they were ang anxious and were really shocked to discover that they were anxious i think most people would put their hands up i mean if i was going to run an addiction course a week long the mastering the addictive personality path out of hell I would say how many people here are anxious? I mean, everyone would put their hands up. Why wouldn't they? It's, 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 yeah, that's what brings people to yoga, actually. That's what brings people to pranayama. That's what brings people to want to change how they feel. So, yeah. And somebody's asked, how do you know if you're anxious? <laughs> I don't know, my darling, I don't know. How do you know if you're anxious? I don't know if you're constantly checking let's imagine even over today let's imagine that you just did yoga with Stuart and Stuart said close your eyes and you just think well I don't want to close my eyes or imagine that you did yoga with me the other day and I say lie back and close your eyes and the first thing you have to do is where's my button where's my water where's my pussycat and my chocolates and if you just can't stop and you can't you know I mean I can't answer that question you'll find out <laughs> Can sad be seen as anxious is the next. Can sad be seen? Now, sad can quite often get confused with shame. We're out of questions. Well, wow, fantastic. Okay, so we keep going. Fantastic. Can sad be seen as anxious? Yes. Okay, so let me keep going. So I want to um, explore. I'm just going to let you digest your lunch a little bit longer. So I'm going to explore a quite an interesting game. And Simon, you're just going to have to help me with the answers here okay so we're going to play a game called the three circles so here's hell okay the middle circle is hell and then we have what's called the slippery slope i promise you i'm not michelangelo that's not bad and then that's hell no that's hell this is the slippery slope and this is what helps okay so my map now obviously you might be here for anxiety but sometimes your anxiety can make you feel really really hideously appalling now if uh, for me as an ex-drug addict and alcoholic with a history of suicidal depression um i would put in there in my hell i would put drugs alcohol gambling and depression they would be my hell i do not want to go back to drugs alcohol gambling or depression so or suicidal depression so i know that one of the things i won't do at the moment and even though i'm fascinated by it i won't go anywhere near bitcoin i'm fascinated by bitcoin ever since it started and every time the news tells me it's up by 25 percent, i have to say no because i've done i've done gambling i've done so much gambling that um and not just ne not just necessarily poker but lots of different ways of gambling so that would be my hell so if you get a, an A4 piece of paper, we're all going to do our own three, three circles, okay? So find an A4 piece of paper. If, 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 if don't, anxiety is not hell, just so you know. I mean, you might think of it as hell, but it's where the anxiety takes you. If the, if the anxiety makes you suicidal, that's what goes in there. So for you, for me, it's the bottom line. Hell is... Really, I just never want to go there again. I, I know I've been there. I never want to go back there. This is what I absolutely, totally know. So that goes in there. So first of all, do your piece of paper, do your three circles, put your middle in here. Now, this is a very interesting tool. It's a tool that I know from when I was in Sex Addicts Anonymous, which was in the 90s. <laughs> My history of... Uh, sexual childhood abuse um was missed up was i was told by patrick Carnes that i was a sex addict which was a kind of really interesting diagnosis but and i don't i don't really regret it but it was a stupid thing to say to somebody with my history but what it led to was that i opened three women's saa groups in london in the 90s and there may be some people here that were there i mean it was some one of the best things i've ever done in my life was running these groups with these women who were just extraordinary and i mean we really did 
we really did have the most extraordinary time exploring our relationship to risk, our relationship to the truth, our relationship to our history as well. And, and, and it was a very interesting thing to do at the time where sex addiction was just really coming online. I'm one of those therapists who doesn't actually believe in sex addiction. So, um, but this three circles is a tool from there. So that's where I first, so I've played with it for a very, very long time. So have, if you've done your inner circle, which is hell, you should have your bottom line in there, not anxiety. Anxiety is gonna go here. So this is the slippery slope. So imagine that if you were looking at a funnel, imagine you're looking at a funnel that looks like that. That's what we're drawing. We're looking at a funnel. So here's hell. This is where you drop down into hell. Here's your slippery slope. Yeah, and there's, there's the behavior that helps. So we could be thinking about the nine layers of hell. If I was running a shame workshop, I'd be looking at the nine layers of hell. And as the day went on, we'd be dropping deeper and deeper and deeper into hell. So put your bottom line in. And then here, what we want to put here are behaviors that cause us problems. The behaviors that take us over there. So I might say lack of sleep. I might put lack of sleep in here. That would be something for me that would take me into my slippery slope. What might also take me into my slippery slope might be sh too much sugar. Uh, it might be um, bad company in terms of people who are very triggering or hanging out with people who are taking a lot of drugs. Or for me, I, I'm not a fan of going to a pub. No, codependency can't go into hell, no. I'm not, a, I wouldn't sort of go to lots of pubs for lunch. I wouldn't hang out in drinky places. So. For me, bad company, lack of sleep, too much sugar. So what else would you put into your procrastination? Very good, exactly. What else? If I can't, if I can't read them, Simon, can you? Self-isolating. Yep, absolutely. And also uh, resentment. I would find resentment. Resentment is an interesting thing. Resentment, in 12-step recovery, they say that resentment is taking the poison and waiting for the other person to die. And it's a French word, which is to ressentir, to refeel. Work addiction, overworking, yep. Panic attacks. Yeah, eating disorder can be put in hell, yep. Panic attacks, yep. Lying. Lying, absolutely. Tiredness, um, uh, loneliness. Yep, that, yep, yep. And quite often we'll fulfill our childhood trauma by making ourselves lonely and isolated. Narcissism? Yep. Mm. You might need to define that slightly better. Someone else's narcissism, I suppose. Yeah, not, not mine, no. Bad I'm boundaries. Mine. Yeah, bad boundaries. Yeah, fear of bad boundaries. Yeah. Fear of rejection. I would say um, rejection. I would say reject or, I mean, that fear of rejection is not necessarily something that goes in here. Self criticism. Yep. So that's shame. Negative fantasy toxic. and shame. Yeah. Hi, Georgie. Yeah. Toxic relationships. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect Traumatic. Perfectionism. Yeah. What else? Uh, neglecting exercise. Yes. Not exercising. Brilliant. Yeah. Junk food. Feeling frozen. Yep. That's a shame. That's a part of the shame fold. I don't yep. have anything in hell. Can you give me more examples of what might go in hell? Now, what might go into hell is feeling suicidal. It could be, um, it could be um, a, an unstoppable eating disorder, not in terms of binging, but more in terms of the purging, that kind of stuff, the anorexia. Um, it could be, um, well, alcoholism, gambling, and gambling in extreme. It's where you're risking your house, that kind of thing. Yep. Avoidance, yep, anger. Yep. More space for the funnel. Um, yep. Not being not being authentic. Inauthentic. Yep. Oh, uh, hormones? Question mark. Um, overspending. Fear of abandonment. Money. Well, we've got loneliness and isolation. Those are where we abandon ourselves, and then we feel neglecting self care. Playing out morbid drama. obesity can be hell. Yes. Go on. Uh, playing out drama stories with family. Yes. So drama triangle. Yep. Shame, anger, yep. Anger. Yep. Um, not connecting to your spirituality or yep. meditation. Yep. 
lots of fitspo content, watching lots of food content. Right. Um, Seeking connection, yeah, so connecting with triggers. So, so what's really interesting, actually, is one of the ways that we can look at this is these are our triggers. It's about paying attention to our triggers because the triggers are what will tip us over. So the purpose of this ring is that it's dangerous behaviors. It's behaviors where we're risking. So let's imagine I could pathetic, I could hypothetically, I could say um, one of the ways I would name this is trawling behaviors. So I have clients who know about trawling behaviors and their trawling behaviors might be that they start watching porn. Now, I'm not culturally, socially or, or homosexually objecting to porn, but sometimes we use porn as a way of, it's a gateway into maybe paying for sex workers, maybe going back into sex work, maybe using chemsex, maybe using different drugs. So we can use porn as a trigger back into our hell. Um, trawling behaviors might be, um, you might be feeling suicidal and you might start trawling on Amazon for ways to kill yourself. You know, different things that you could buy. Trawling, like, like a ship, you know, like a ship with those big nets pulling, pulling everything in. Because, because in this behavior, we abandon ourselves and we, we either abandon ourselves into this kind of isolation or we go out and we look to bring things in. So maybe you haven't been smoking for a while and you pick up smoking, but then you always associate smoking with drinking. So smoking for me would be a gateway drug back into drinking. Yeah. So it's this, everything that comes in here is about triggers. It's about behavior that will tip us over. And sometimes we can have multiples. So we may get into, let's imagine that over lockdown or over Christmas, maybe you've started to have, you know, there's been too much family around. You've been triggered too often. You've gone back to smoking. You're finding, you're telling yourself, why the fuck aren't I drinking? I could drink and you've eaten too much sugar. What are you going to do? Because you're not very far away from hell. So, and, and also maybe you've decided I'm bored and you make, you make yourself a profile on a dating app where you go somewhere like, you know, one of those more extreme dating apps like FetLife. And I didn't know, I'm staggered that I didn't know that um, Facebook owned Tinder. Who knew that? So they know everything. If you're on Tinder, they know your sexual preferences. They know everything. So this is trawling behavior. This is where you're looking to trigger yourself because that's what we do. We find people who will trigger us. We find behaviors that will trigger us. We enjoy feeling anxious because it's basically, it's a trauma bond. We bond to our trauma by seeking out. You might find that you have a crush on somebody or you have a set of obsessions and you trawl on Facebook or Instagram to see who's followed them or who's liked them or, you know, you'll look at the people that like somebody and follow them and you'll start, that's trawling behavior. So, yes. So is this clear? Do you think we've done this, Simon? I think so. Yeah, I think it's pretty full. You're yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now let's look at what helps, what gets us back into the zone. What is good for us? What do we think helps us to feel positive, good, playful, and in our parasympathetic system, nature, yes, nature, do it in green, there's my green pen, nature, yeah, whatever. Yoga, yoga, yoga. friends, Brilliant. walking, exercise. Yoga. Exactly. Uh, some of the spirituality, drinking water, um, uh, this life divine, someone put that sweet, um, <laughs> uh, animals, Yes. Eat, eating well, healthy, healthily, music, dancing, laughing, yep. love. Slow down. <laughs> I'm reading it as fast as they come up. Um, <laughs> Laughter, good company. Yeah. And that's, that can also be on Zoom. I mean, you know, I teach a, two weekly classes, hugs, 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 yes. Um, I teach two weekly, weekly classes and yes, we're on Zoom and yes, we're in this hideous pandemic, but actually, we have such a great connection because we've all been together and the new people that join get really welcomed in. And that's what, partly what we've got going on here. Tell me what else we've got. Creativity. Yes. Washing. I saw of, somebody put creative showering. Um, yeah. We, well, if somebody asked, um, why do we do this trolling behavior though? Why, why do we want to subconsciously trigger our own trauma? Because we're addicted to the shame and we're addicted to the trauma hormones. We find ourselves more safe in the trauma hormones. It's an interesting one because actually it takes us into the window of tolerance. 
which is another theory like the uh, negativity bias. It's what we find bearable. And for most of us, if we have a tall, dark history, we'll, we'll find that we're much better. We feel like we're more capable when we're really anxious and stressed. And it's a little bit scary to be still. So you have to get used to being still. That's why the mat is a magical question. So really? what else have we got on the outside? Um, we got showering already, listening to helpful podcasts, um, mm -hmm. meditation, cold shower, self-massage. Cold water, yes. All of that is great. I haven't written it all down, but it doesn't mean I'm not interested. We got back-to-back -back prayers, um, swimming. Yep. A healthy bit of solitude, deep breathing. Yep. Pranayama. Can you see down here? Yep. Guided gratitude. Oh my God, gratitude. What a lovely thing. Gratitude and affirmation. Oh, and chanting kirtan. That wasn't me. Yeah. Wasn't me. Um, beauty, flowers, yep. journaling. Yep. Celestial meditation. Lovely. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, my writing looks like crap. I'm sorry. But that's exactly, exactly, exactly. All of these is lovely. Nourishing good food, yep, and cooking, yep. Exactly, actually lovely. So this is, this is where you want to be, you want to climb back out. You want to find ways to climb back out. Obviously it's shame that's gonna keep you in here. It's the fascination. It's the, what we tend to do is we fetishize our, we fetishize our bodies, We've, if you've got, you know, body dysmorphia or you've got, if you're very triggered by your body, then you fetishized your body. We fetishize our sexuality through dating apps and porn. We fetishize our feelings by constantly letting ourselves be triggered. And then we just sort of feast on it, you know, like we gorge on this self-fetishization. When we do this stuff, we're out. We've allowed ourselves to get into what's called the parasympathetic system. Going to do it in bright pink parasympathetic you've sent in the paramedics you've taken care you've landed parasympathetic system so this is why yoga and meditation and pranayama help because they take us here you know obviously i'm not selling you know today we're not we're not offering you on this thing to say let's all go for a walk we can't but you can we're not saying let's all cook food. And actually somebody said, why aren't we doing anything about nutrition? Because actually there's enough self-harming with food in this community without anyone else having to add to it. So I don't tend to talk about food anymore. There's, oh look, can I talk about food and sugar addiction, drugs and alcohol? Nice to see you use it again, but when it comes to eating food, I get a bit confused. Hard one. Um, so this is about taking care of the self and coming out of the parasympathetic system. I mean, if I jump away from where you were, Simon, into what Priscilla was asking here, food is a really interesting one. What we do with food, we can starve ourselves, which is a way of proving that we have no desire. We can, um, because we feel shame about desire. We feel shame about the fact that we have needs and we have desires. When we're purging, we're trying to, we have shame that we're trying to get out of our body. So the purging behaviors are a way of trying to purge out the shame. So different eating disorders have different uh, roots in a funny way. Um, to have a, we can, be, we can be anorexic and starving ourselves and living on this kind of curious, I'm only eating four things in my life because, I have, because I'm so perfect, but actually it's a form of shame. The overeating is about trying to keep the feelings down. So the um, excessive eating, where you can't stop eating is about trying to keep the emotions down and the purging is about trying to purge the feelings out as a lot of the cutting disorders are about trying to stop the feelings but also one of the side effects of the purging is obviously the dopamine and the serotonin so after the purging you get this momentary extraordinary calm and then it gets triggered all again so you've got this fantastic cycle we're quite often in these big triangles of victim, persecutor, rescuer, but a lot of us are holding them inside ourselves. So we're recycling them inside ourselves. So, um, so Simon, where are we, my darling? Um, we've got a question about um, uh, recommend, recommending online therapy. Uh, if this, um, consider the limitations on our current Zoom lifestyle placed on moving forward deep trauma and shame work that requires in-person therapy, what do you suggest are the best ways to keep working on trauma and shame while limited to online therapy and DIY? I mean, but what's wrong with online therapy? I do online therapy all the time. And actually 
I found it's almost been deeper in lockdown than it was before. It's an interesting time to be with a therapist if you can find somebody who'll take you on or that you like. It's Even a, you it's know, stressful. Huh? No, I thought say? you were finished. Um, I, I don't have any. I don't see any limitations on uh, online therapy at all. I find it fascinating, and I think that I found that it hasn't stopped me doing anything in this time at all. And clients that I was seeing before, we still work together, and I've taken on lots of new, you know, lots of new clients over this time. And um, nothing is limited. The only thing is, I won't do a shame workshop online. So that's the only thing I don't do. Everything else that I was doing in person, I do online. So. So, um, yeah, not a problem at all. I don't see why it's a problem. I think that Zoom is, Zoom is a really interesting thing. I mean, I've, I've run workshops for people. Sometimes I've, I've, I get invited to, to run workshops for big corporations and companies. And um, one of the things I find really unpleasant is when I'm running a workshop, I turn up to teach a workshop and all the cameras are off. I, I don't like that. What I do like about the yoga community is that we're generous enough to actually have our cameras on. So there's a relational space. I am relational. I am good in relationships. So what I like is the fact that I can see people and we can talk and we can smile and we can, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll say, you know, come, come closer and I'll lean right in much closer than I am now. My computer is about a meter away from me, but I'll do very close work with people and it's incredibly intimate. And I don't see that it's a limitation. I think Zoom has proved itself to be an extraordinary, extraordinary tool in this time. And it's not got all those things that um, social media has. It doesn't have flashing red lights. It doesn't have the triggers. It is a neutral, stable platform, which works really well for communication. So I'm a great fan. Given that stress hormones create horrible feelings immediately, why are they addictive? because we're having a temper tantrum next to the sweets in the supermarket aisle. And the more we stay in our trauma, the more we're convinced that somebody's going to come and pick us up and tell us it's okay. It's a child, it's the child state. It's very, very addictive. They're very addictive to be in that child state. So some of us find that in the stillness, if we're calm and peaceful, some of us really fear that because somehow we feel like we're not, we're not somehow taking care. We're not, um, we're not paying attention, something bad is going to happen. It's a, it's a highly addictive thing and it's very difficult to break. So going back to what I was talking about, I think on the first day about how difficult it is to come out of the safety states because the safety state says, don't leave me. You can't leave me. You can't stop doing this because this is the only thing that keeps me safe. It takes time to be able to bear yourself. And that's why yoga is lovely. You find teachers, you've had some amazing teachers on this. And you, you find teachers that you like, you know, you might specifically relate to one of the teachers and then allow that teacher, you gift the teacher the possibility that they could help you land into a state of presence. And that's a really extraordinary thing to be allowed to have is presence. How are we doing, Simon? Where are we? You're good. We're good. Just holding that moment. You've got me a present. Um, could you expand on not believing in sex addiction? What about love addiction? Where does this leave <laughs> SLAA and other 12-step programs for individuals in recovery from addicted and traumatic relationships? I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to diss any recovery programs. Good for you if you're in recovery from love addiction. But love addiction, it's all, and love addiction is part of the whole codependency movement, which was started by Pia Melody and Patrick Carnes. And there's a whole raft of us who are therapists who don't subscribe to that, any of that theory. We work in a whole different series of theories. So as a therapist, I'm trained in different forms of theory, but also because I am the kind of therapist that I am, I'm also able to create theory. I can explore something and say, actually, this, this is a different way of thinking about it. And this actually works over time. I can work out this is, another way of thinking about it, this work. So the embodiment that has come through the marrying of therapeutic work alongside posture work and breath work has led to lots of shifts and changes alongside the work of someone like Bessel van der Kalk. But sex addiction and sex and love addiction are a very specific school of theory. I'm trained in other types of theory. So if 12-step recovery and the St. Augustine fellowships, because anything like SLAA is self St. Augustine fellowships, if they work for you, that's great. And if that, if that makes you happy, that's great. 
I don't agree with the idea that one is a sex addict. I think one has an attachment deficit. I think one is unable to soothe the self and therefore you look to someone else to soothe you. So I would say work on soothing yourself, then you won't need that behavior. Boom, it's a different way of thinking about it. It's just theory. You have, you're subscribing to one theory, I subscribe to a different theory. But if you want to look at the alternatives to sex addiction, the alternative way of thinking about it, there's a very good book by David Lay, L-E-Y, David Lay, called The Myth of Sex Addiction. And it's a, it's a very good book. It's one of the kind of core fundamental books written by a clever man about why sex addiction doesn't exist. So, yes. Um, okay, going back a bit. Uh, do you believe we can end our, our anxiety if we keep working with our triggers and use the correct tools? Well, I mean, I, I have no idea what your triggers are and I don't know how you mean to work with your triggers. Do I believe you can end your anxiety? I mean, it's about, it's, you know, anxiety is a safety state. You've got to choose to put it down. You've got to choose to begin to trust yourself. And when you begin to trust yourself, I mean, you might, you might, you might, maybe you have, you know, maybe you have a lump in your breast or you have a problem in your body, then you're going to be anxious. That's absolutely inevitable it's almost impossible to override that anxiety that anxiety is functional anxiety it has a cause it has a reason it has a reason for existing and until you can sort that lump out you're going to be really scared if you've got to go to hospital let's say now even if you're you know you're walking towards having a child or being pregnant at the moment i can't think of anything more stressful than being pregnant or a new mother right now it is so stressful to have anxiety around that stuff would be insane not to have it so but some of us have anxiety because we don't trust ourselves we have a fractured relationship to ourselves so we don't trust ourselves so we spend our whole time in a child state hoping that somebody else will come and sort it out and it's 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 impossible to say yes to a question like that because it depends on what you're doing about it and whether or not you actually want to change it it is about finding the tools that work. And what's really interesting here, you've got some extraordinary things. Nobody, there isn't running on here. Maybe running was said and I didn't write it down. Running is amazing. Um, nature's fantastic. Cold water, cold water swimming, cold water, cold showers is very good. Uh, pranayama is amazing, but equally is fine. If, it's, if you're suffering with anxiety, um, CBT works really well for anxiety, cognitive behavioral therapy. A lot of people find that that works very well. But if you know that it was something that happened a long time ago, you know, go and find a therapist, research your therapist and say, I want to do 10 sessions on anxiety. And they might say, okay, fine. It depends. I mean, I don't tend to do that kind of short work, but lots of people do. So it, there's some of these questions are unanswerable, but what I thought we could do now is look at some physical tools that really help. So is there anything outstanding, Simon, that I absolutely have to answer right now? No, I, th I think that's okay. I think, I think you're covered. Yeah. Yeah. Apologies to anybody if they disagree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you have a system that's contracted when you're in your anxiety, when you're in your trauma, when you're in your tall, dark history, when you're in your eating disorders or when you're feeling disturbed, you have a system that's contracted. Now you can choose to stay contracted. So therefore you will be offending in your behavior. You will be acting out, offending against yourself. We either offend in or we offend out. That's what we do. I wrote on my board actually, oppressors and offending. One of the things that the news does, just going back to here, one of the things that the news does is that it likes us to be oppressed and offended because if we're oppressed and offended, it allows us to be in here. To be oppressed and offended takes us in here. So I thought I'd just get past that. Um, we have things that will work very, very quickly to change how we feel. I'm drinking water because it helps lubricate my brain. I drink a lot of water, especially when I'm with clients all day. I drink water because it keeps my brain clear. But if you're feeling very stressed, if you drink a glass of very cold water, it will change your nervous system. It just does it like that. There's a massive shift to your system. If you drink a large glass of water, you'll hydrate your fascia, your vagus nerve, and the act of swallowing will go oh okay okay that's good thank you so much if you stretch there's that famous stretch which i know a lot of people have been doing let's look at a different stretch 
I'm wearing a black velvet jacket. It's hard to see, but that's my elbow. I'm holding my shoulder. Here's my elbow. Put your hand on your shoulder. It doesn't matter whether you're on the floor or on a chair. It doesn't matter. Bend forward and exhale and really stretch your spine. Open your shoulder blades. And then as you inhale, straighten up. Inhale, raise your elbow up in front of your face. Raise your chin. Notice and then take your elbow back and twist. Twist open. You go into the left side of the vagus nerve and the fascia and you say, actually, I'm good. Do the other side. So now elbow in front of your face, inhaling, lifting up. And twisting away. Take a moment, close your eyes. Just eyes closed, sit very still and very calm. And just notice there's a thing happening in the body. Just try and stay with it. See if you can close your eyes. If you can't close your eyes, you'll know you're anxious. I'm not going to move. I'm the same twinkly lights, the same black jacket. And just let that happen. You've triggered a dopamine rush. You've released your vagus nerve and your organs are relaxing. And from here now, See if you can do this without opening your eyes. Simple instructions. If you need to keep opening your eyes because it's unbearable not to check, then you're anxious. Little tests, little litmus tests. So make very tight lips. And... Hold the breath for a moment and then exhale nose. your hands on your knees as you breathe out let yourself sink a little bit inhaling hold exhale nose Now breathe more quietly, you'll breathe more gently, and you'll breathe more slowly. And exhale. And just be soft. Try not to open your eyes if you need immediately to check something. I mean, obviously, there may be a child or a puppy, but otherwise, just be very still. See what it's like now. Just reset your system. And there may not be an immediate need to breathe again. There may be very calm breath, very gentle mind. 
Just imagine that you could explore this stillness. What is this stillness like? Is it a pleasure? Is it uncomfortable? Have you got this desperate urge to see where your button is or your water or your sock? Some random nothing that your brain wants to attach itself to? Or are you allowed? Can you allow yourself to be still and gentle? and calm and quiet. I'm going to stay with your eyes closed. I'm just going to move my board. I'm going to go over to the um, mat. I want to show you one other thing and then I'll come back for some last questions. So if you're not on a mat, maybe now open your eyes, but also just pay attention to how you just made yourself feel. So let's play with the divine in the body. Let's play with the possibility that we are extraordinary and exquisite and that we do, oh, I'm going to disappear, aren't I? Look at me, I'm all in black against an almost black wall. Hang on a minute. That would probably work a bit better. You can see me. Anyway, I've got white hair. I stand out. Okay, so here I am. I'm sitting cross-legged on a black mat. Ah, oh, there we are. It seems to have lit up a bit. So I'm going to get you to sit comfortably. Ideally, you'll sit cross-legged. If you can't do it on a chair, but sitting cross-legged, you will get more from it if you can sit cross-legged. Let me just find a piece of music and I've left my glasses over there. So hang on a moment. So just be in that same calm stillness that you were in before. So you're going to sit tall and straight what I want you to do, you're going to play with the divine. You're going to play with the internal relationship to the divine. Imagine you could soothe this child within and that you could also awaken the Kundalini and that you could create within yourself this state of very extraordinary calm stillness. So initially your hands are on your knees, but if you need to put your hands by your side, that's fine. You're going to inhale to the center. And then as you exhale, you allow your head to drop. You inhale up and then you exhale and your head is going to drop to the other side. And then you inhale up and your head goes to a little bit lower and you inhale up and then you go to the other side and your head goes a little bit lower again. So you're moving gently lower and lower, but you keep your buttocks on the floor. So, so Simon, come back, be my assistant. I'm back, there we are. Hi, Simon. So I think it's the last few minutes um, of this in terms of what I would like to bring. I think the invitation really about a for this for this lecture today and for this last day is it is actually about the fact that you do have you do have extraordinary tools available to us you to you you have all of us for a start and all these films will be on vimeo and um you have loads of you know yoga has has come into its own in this time it's been an extraordinary gift for yoga and um it's about really learning to activate yourself. You know, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that with yoga, you do, you give permission to the good teachers to help you change how you feel. And then ultimately in between your yoga classes, you may only have one yoga class a week um, or two, which is an awful lot of hours in which to be unhappy, anxious and triggered. So perhaps you could start a personal practice. Perhaps you could start doing stuff for yourself. Perhaps you could consciously you know, have time where your phone isn't on all the time, have time where you don't have to be checking all the time. I have a rule that I can look at Facebook once a day. I can look at the news once a day. I'm allowed, I have three, I have three Instagram accounts. 
I'm on there's only one account I actually look at and I'm allowed to look at I allow myself to look at 10 pictures which means I've got to look at three adverts as well but because there's a pic there's an advert now is it every two pictures but about making rules that support your staying present making contracts in a way rules contracts you make a contract with yourself I make contracts with myself I, I got, you know, I got divorced quite a long time ago now, 12 years ago, but I remember when I first got divorced, I was so angry and I was so rageful about the court stuff and, you know, what happened. And I just thought, I don't want to feel like this. You know, I've ended this relationship. I don't want to be thinking this stuff. So I put myself on a contract for 30 days that I couldn't think or say anything negative. And it was so extraordinarily effective that I stayed on it and it's 12 years. I just can't, I just can't, I just really don't have the time. And I don't consider that to be spiritual bypassing. So um, I consider that to be a, a, the ability to regulate the self where I just think, I just don't wanna go towards that kind of negative thinking. So that's, let's take a couple more questions, Simon, and then let's go from there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, various movement therapies and breath work undoubtedly encourage great release and help in so many ways in resetting our system's rhythms. Is there a way of knowing when greater in intervention is needed? For example, how to know how much of our disconnection is a result of emotional dysregulation and how much is, say, chemical imbalances or genetic predispositions? I've noticed that meditation yoga is actually really difficult and effective for some. A genetic predisposition is an attachment to a family system. So that really, that, that now we now know that with epigenetics, you can change your DNA. You, you can choose to be the same, like your dad was, a, was an addict, you can be an addict. Your dad was a gambler, you can be a gambler. Your mother was a violently bad-tempered woman, you can be a violently bad-tempered woman. It's, you can change that. You don't have to stay with that. I, I don't think, I think that people do what they'll do. Either you'll stay stuck in your story or you'll do something about it. And I think that, Yoga does help, but I don't believe personally, and I wouldn't teach, as I said on the first day, I wouldn't teach a yoga for trauma work workshop because I don't agree that that's the way to move trauma. I think that um, it helps, but I don't believe that it fundamentally removes anything. And I think that you can, I, you know, my job, it's a bit like sometimes people will ask me for therapy and then they might say, so, so what do you think I should work on? I've got no idea. What do you want to work on? And they might say, I'd like you to coach me. I'm not a coach, so I don't do coaching. Well, what do you think I should do? It's not my job. It's not my job to tell you what to do. It's really not my job. You have to give me a job. And if what the job you give me aligns with my work, then fantastic. So they might say, well, um, they might, I don't know what, they might invite me to work with them on something completely random that has nothing to do with what I do. Then it's not, I'm not your therapist. I'm not, it's not my job to say, you know, Sometimes I might, I might say to somebody in terms of a client session, it might be, you know, it's obvious you've got quite a lot of trauma and I, I don't know if you want to deal with that or not. I'm not inviting you to deal with it. It's your decision. Taking on trauma work, taking on this kind of much deeper shame work, it's a commitment. It's not a nanosecond. It's a long-term commitment to self-care. Taking on addiction and self-harming behaviors is a long-term commitment to self-care. So this life divine, all of us accumulated together We've made commitments to ourselves to that practice of a long-term a long-term commitment to the self so i can't say you've got to do this and you should do that I, I never would it's not it's not how i work but i would say that chemical imbalances are due to the long-term stress in the body so it's your decision what you want to do with that go on simon let's move when I pull the root lock, I've sometimes felt myself pull negative energy in. It's sometimes taken a few days to get it out, like someone else's energy. I mean, there's nothing to say, really. Um, what is tightness in the psoas muscle related to? Stress. If someone watches DVDs from when they were three, when they were struggling, would this probably mean is how old they feel when they are anxious? I have no idea. It might be kind of triggering to watch it. And then you might think, oh, that's interesting because that's how I feel when I get upset, in which case you could probably say that. Yeah. Will we be having a Vimeo page with this Life Divine? We will be using my Vimeo page at the moment because actually I hate to say this, but we haven't covered our costs. To run a page on Vimeo costs a huge amount of money. So at the moment you'll be on the Carolyn Cowan page on Vimeo because uh, so many people have done it for free and so many people who like the first day, then took the free option for the next two days. So at the moment, we're kind of limited by the finances of what we can do. So it'll be on Carolyn Cowan. It'll be private on Carolyn Cowan. 
and the invitation will be not to share the link on. What would you do? What would you recommend to do when I wake up in the middle of the night with anxiety? Pranayama? Stretch, stretch, stretch. Roll over onto your stomach, do cobra. Do three cobras, stretch your neck, stick your tongue out. And then within 10 minutes, you'll be asleep. The best thing to do is then with your mind is just to go, yes. Mind says, you know, yes. Mind goes, yes. You just go, yes, yes. You just keep saying yes, and you'll be asleep in three minutes, five, 10 minutes usually. Three cobras. If you wake up in the night, this is your vagus nerve. This is your history coming up. I teach a lot about sleep, and I have a great anxiety hack workshop that focuses one of the one whole section is on sleep. And it's good. In reference to personal practice, it'd be great to hear what people might find possible with a newborn baby. I have five minutes here and there. Oh, my darling, with a newborn baby, go for walks. I'm sorry. I mean, no, I wouldn't say to do too much. I would say go for walks. Your bones of your body, you know, for the first three months, bind your belly, wrap your belly, go for walks, wear a hot water bottle against your belly. You want to put heat into your body. Be kind. You don't have to do anything. There's nothing. If you want to do anything, just sing or dance, but be really kind. Don't don't add anything into what you're going through. Wait at least four months before you think about doing part of any kind of practice. I know it helps to feel better. If you find the tears are overwhelming, cold shower is very useful, but walking is probably the best thing you can possibly do. And having your belly wrapped, don't worry about practice. If you like breathing, breathe. I mean, if you like practice breathing, you know, committed breathing, then breathe, but I wouldn't worry about anything else. I'm recently working with my inner child. She's really upset and I find and I'm finding my healing is coming from losing my fear around holding her in tears. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, inner child work is really interesting. Really, um, really interesting. What if, what if you constantly break the contracts you make with yourself? It's your choice. That's the hard thing, isn't it? So do you deserve something better? So that's going to be the shame and the procrastination. The not deserving. How can you tell in your client's trauma? How can you tell if your client's trauma is being released? What do you see here, experience in that? Oh my God, huge! I mean, I do. Yeah, it's 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 a journey. If I'm going to take when I take clients on, there's a series of things that tell me where we are. So it's never the same piece of work. It's never the same route. It's never the same tools. But over time, I can see the markers for. Okay, we're there. So, you know, I can notice, can this person identify their feelings? No. Okay. So we're very young. Do they know their story? No. Okay. So we're very young. So then we work to get them older and then bit by bit by bit. And then there come, there come markers on the journey. It's just like, oh, okay, that's really cool. Well done. Okay, great. You know, can I take care of my triggers? Can I change how I feel? Can I remember to stretch? You know, minor things, but actually with a lot of wounding, when there's a lot of wounding in place, we don't, we tend to look for somebody else. So my job is to be with somebody and facilitate them taking steps. And when the steps start to be taken, then the journey is being made. I, I sort of consider myself to go on a train journey with somebody. And there are stops that I know along the way, but it isn't always the same work. So that's what tells me. We've got one minute left. Do you want another question or? One last question, Simon. You've been <clears throat> such a brilliant moderator. Okay. Do you know if emotional freedom technique is effective for trauma and addiction? I do not. Um, when breathing, when breathing, is it best to breathe in your nose and out of your mouth or nose or does it matter? There's a thousand ways to breathe. I mean, literally, I teach a pranayama training. There are so many different ways to breathe and every breath has a different effect. And there can be some really fundamentalist thought processes about how you should breathe like Badeko or Wim Hof or Stanislav Graf or there's all kinds of different room you know rules about how you should breathe but actually there's a thousand ways to breathe there's a thousand pranayamas and and I teach on the pranayama course and I quite often do pranayama series um you know early in the morning I haven't got one at the moment but I'll set one um and then you'll discover all the different types of breathing I don't tend to be particularly fundamentalist about that stuff I, I think that you'll breathe and you'll play with the breath and that's what's really interesting is to play so should we stop, Simon? Do you think people need a break? You're out of time, yeah. I think they need a break from me, don't you? Um, I'm not commenting on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
listen, I'm really grateful for you, Simon, thank you. And I'm very, very grateful for all of you for such an extraordinary commitment. I, you're amazing. You're amazing. You're brilliant. Well done for being here. And some of you have just been here all the days. And I find that ex an extraordinary commitment. And I'm so proud of everybody that I have trained and everybody else who's joined me here in terms of the teachers and the other therapists. So really, really mwah, great. Thank you. Well done. I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon. And you've got to let me know what you want to do and support us so we can do more because